All right, well, tonight we're going to take our Bibles, and if you'll turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, uh, John, chapter 21, and uh, for our Bible study tonight, I'm going to embrace a, probably a very unusual topic, but I think one that um, we ought to hear, and one that uh, hopefully uh, will be taken in the right spirit and applied as God would have it be applied to our lives. John chapter 21 and beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in, uh, draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat under him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Well, as we read this passage, it's uh, somewhat appropriate at this season of the year with fishing and swimming, and uh, one of the blessings I find personally of living in the Pacific Northwest uh, is that, uh, except for the last several days, uh, we have fairly cool summers. And uh, if you've uh, gone swimming recently, you'll know that even the water is still pretty cold, even on the hottest of days. But I found over the years that as a pastor, uh, one of the issues that you have to try to navigate through the summer months, uh, in particularly in the hotter locations, is uh, what you see around the swimming holes and uh, uh, even in town. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about the scantily clad population and the uncovering of the flesh. Uh, I know in Australia you couldn't go to some beaches because especially you couldn't go there, well anyway, but even with children for what you might see or not uh, see there. And uh, when I was pastoring in Australia, we would dread the long Australian summers uh, because of some of the dress issues that, uh, that came about as a result of that. And uh, so while uh, swimming is a wonderful thing and fishing is a wonderful thing, as we read about here, uh, I'd say it's an issue among pastors on the issue of the attire as well as uh, Uh, something that we do face when we have uh, children's camps and youth camps, and that is on the issue of mixed swimming. But I want you to notice in verse number 7, and this is not really a text for the message, this is a topical message that I'll be preaching, but verse number 7 has an interesting statement. Uh, We read, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat under him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And uh, what we have here is a a scene on a balmy April night uh, that uh, as the morning broke, it found these men toiling, these expert fishermen, they were toiling and sweating. And no doubt it was hot work trying to draw in the nets and not finding anything. And the Bible tells us that Peter was naked. And uh, in order to swim to the shore, he threw a coat around himself. He put on his fisherman's coat and he swam a hundred yards to the shore to be with the Lord. 
And as I look at this verse, I ask the question, well, what does it mean that Peter was naked? Uh, was Peter in the wrong here as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who had walked with the Lord for uh, three years or thereabouts and uh, knew the teachings of the Lord? Uh, was it wrong? Well, he was with other men. And uh, so uh, I want to ask that question, but also to what extent was he naked? And so if you'll bear with me, and I'll do my best to be as discreet as possible, I do want to bring a Bible study on what the Bible says about nakedness. Uh, if Peter was naked here, is it okay for Christians today to bear the flesh when they go swimming? What does the Bible say on this subject, and how is nakedness defined in the Bible? And how does the Bible teaching apply to me and to my family? It's interesting that it's not a minor subject in the Bible. The word naked is found about 30 times in reference to personal nakedness and another 17 times in a figurative sense, often to refer to the nation of Israel or even to the church. You'll remember the church at Laodicea. The Lord said that you are naked and blind and uh, he was referring to their spiritual condition. Uh, so about 30 times referencing personal nakedness and then uh, about 30 times is the word nakedness found, uh, plus another 13 times uh, in a figurative sense, and about 10 times in the Bible is the word uncovered used. And I would say by the amount of usage in the Bible that this is a, 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 not a minor issue with God. So I want to ask this first question, how does the Bible define nakedness? Well, as, a, as you study the Bible, I think you'll find that there are two definitions or two ways that nakedness is used in the Bible. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Job is, uh, he says these words, uh, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. And so here we would see that nakedness is used in reference to completely unclothed, but also there is a nakedness that is really immodestly clothed. And many times in the Bible that is being referred to, and I think uh, with this instance with Peter, that would be the case. Immodestly clothed. Uh, let me give you a scripture for that. In Job 22 and verse 6, Job talks about, um, actually I don't think it's Job who's speaking here, but talks about being stripped, stripping the naked of their clothing. Well, uh, how would you strip the naked of their clothing if the naked weren't first wearing clothes? And so defining this term nakedness, uh, there are two ways of looking at it, and the context would normally bear that out, uh, either as, as a newborn babe, completely unclothed, uh, and then in the Bible, more often uh, clothed in an immodest uh, way. And so nakedness can include clothing that we would probably refer to more today as underwear. I see here that Peter was no doubt in the fishing boat and he had stripped himself down to his underwear. That's why when he saw the Lord, he put on a coat. He wanted to be decent before the Lord. And there are other kinds of this, uh, other instances of this kind of nakedness that we find in the Bible. Uh, let me give you one of concerning King Saul in 1 Samuel 19, verse 20, and then verse 24. Uh, here the Bible says, And Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? I don't know why they did that, uh, wasn't just Saul, it was all of these who were prophesying, but for some reason they removed a lot of their clothing. Another example would be that of King David. As they brought the ark into the city of God, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 16 and 20 and 21, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. 
And then David returned to bless his household and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself to uh, today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord which chose me before the, thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord and over Israel, therefore I will play before the Lord. And also the prophet Isaiah. Um, in Isaiah 20 verse 2, God instructed him to do this and at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos saying, go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put off thy shoe from thy foot, and he did so walking naked and barefoot. barefoot. Now, I believe in these cases, as with Peter, uh, who was there fishing, that uh, they had stripped themselves down to their undergarments, and the Bible refers to that as being uncovered or as being naked. So let's look at what the Bible has to say on this subject. And uh, we need to go back to the book of Genesis, of course, and that's the book of beginnings to chapter number two. And we have the first mention of nakedness in the Bible. Genesis chapter two, if you'll turn there, in verse number 21 through 25, talks about the, the creation of an helpmeet for Adam. And the Lord God, in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And then verse 25 says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now I want you to mark that in your minds, they were not ashamed. But if you'll turn over to Exodus chapter 32, I want you to see a contrast here and explain, I'll explain what the difference is. In Exodus chapter 32, uh, just to set the context in verse 1, Moses has gone up onto the mountain to receive the commandments and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him up make us gods which shall go before us for as for this Moses the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt we wot not what is become of him and Aaron said unto them break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they arose up early on the morning and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now, if you look across to verse number 15, Moses comes down from the mountain. And uh, verse 15, as Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hands, or in his hand, the tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other that were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, is not, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And then down in verse 25 and 26, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, 
For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame, unto their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Now I want you to notice that there's a difference. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed. Here in Exodus chapter 32, the people are uh, they're naked, they're, they begin with idolatry and revelry, dancing and immorality, uh, which the Bible says they were naked to their shame. There is a shame in nakedness, and uh, if you read on, uh, 3,000 were killed on that day. So what's the difference between Genesis 2:25 and uh, Exodus chapter 32, verse 25? In one, they were naked and not ashamed. In the other, they were naked and to their shame. Well, the difference is that Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were created in a state of innocence. They had no knowledge of good and evil. But once sin entered into the equation, and we read about that in Genesis chapter 3, where Eve was deceived and Adam willfully disobeyed the commandment of God and sin came into the world... Immediately there was a consciousness of evil. Turn back there, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse number 7. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Well, there was a great change that took place when sin entered into the world. It changed the equation. And because their conscience was awakened and they came to realize that they were there in their shame. Since Genesis chapter 3 in the Bible, nakedness is always associated with shame and deprivation. In fact, the very last mention that we find in the book of the Revelation uh, of nakedness in the Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now that verse may be speaking in a figurative or a spiritual sense, uh, but either way, nakedness is associated with shame. And it has since Genesis chapter 3 throughout the Bible. Well, if nakedness does not mean that one has to be completely devoid of clothing, then what does it mean? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says that Adam and Eve made aprons. And uh, that's, uh, they made them out of fig leaves. They made aprons. But in verse 21 of chapter 3, God made coats and he clothed them. It's interesting. Uh, in verse 21 of chapter 3 in Genesis, and unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The Bible doesn't say that those fig leaves and those aprons really did anything. Uh, but uh, uh, God certainly clothed them. And we have a wonderful picture of the gospel there in the shedding of innocent blood to cover the guilty pair. In Job 31 and verse 3, Job makes this statement. He says, if I covered my transgressions as Adam. And in the context of that, he's saying, you know, if that's all I did before God, that wasn't enough. My, my transgressions were not really covered. He spoke about how Adam tried to cover up his shame by making an apron just to cover perhaps the bare minimum, but uh, it wasn't sufficient and God covered Adam with skins. So when we talk about this idea of nakedness, how do we define it? Well, there's an indication, I think, given in Exodus chapter 28. I'd like you to turn there. 
Uh, this is having to do with the office of the priest of Israel. And in verse number 40, uh, God is giving instruction here through Moses for the clothing of the priests. And uh, in verse number 40, the Bible says, And for Aaron's sons shalt thou make coats, thou shalt make for them girdles, and bonnets thou shalt make for them for glory and for beauty. Now let me just stop there and say that uh, there's some words that are uh, used perhaps a little differently today. Uh, we understand what a coat is, but a girdle, uh, that really just means a belt uh, that would go around the girth. And uh, uh, a lot of times the girdle wasn't uh, like we would wear, a leather belt uh, with holes and, and a buckle. It would be more of a sash that would be tied up. So that's what a girdle is. It's really like a, a, a belt. And the bonnets would be just a hat. Um, I guess no guy would want to be seen in a bonnet today of the way we would use the word, but it really just means a hat. And these were specially made garments and specially designed garments, as the Bible says in verse 40, for glory and for beauty. But it goes on, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now notice verse 42. Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. And here is the dimension of a scriptural covering. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. And so the loins to the thighs. Well, for men, that would be from waist down to the knee. That is the area that God wants to be covered. And other scriptures bear that out as well. Look over in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 1 through 3. Uh, here, of course, um, it's being used in a, in a spiritualized sense, in a way of uh, figurative language. But I think we get the message here. Uh, God is uh, pronouncing judgment here upon the nation of Babylon, says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Now notice this next phrase, Uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. And so again, when God prescribed the garments for the, uh, the priests, they were to cover the thighs from the waist to the knees. And uh, here, of course, nakedness is the uncovered thigh. So I think that gives us a picture of how God uh, sees things in Isaiah chapter 20 and verse number 4. It's a little bit more graphic here, but in Isaiah 20 and verse number 4, the Bible says, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. Well, if we read the Bible, I think it's pretty clear where uh, God uh, draws the line at what is proper and what is really considered to be nakedness. In 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 4, the Bible says, Wherefore Hanun, uh, these were the, this was the Ammonite king, and uh, he'd just taken the throne, and David had sent ambassadors to, uh, with, uh, you know, to, to say nice things to him. The Bible says, Wherefore Hanun took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. And he sent them away in shame. And, of course, that caused David to get very angry and ended up going to war against the Ammonites. Now, I bring these scriptures out because I want to make it clear that the Bible does have... Uh, it's not an arbitrary thing that it's up to what you think is right or what I think is right. It really is spelled out for us in the Word of God. And I think we get the big picture here that proper clothing is important to God. Proper clothing is important. Uh, we know that God's word instructs women to wear modest apparel. We read that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. 
with shamefacedness. That word shamefacedness means bashful, not forwardness, not pushing the image before others. And sobriety, which means self-control, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So the Bible gives instruction to Christian women on how they are to dress. Uh, the, 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 uh, the word here is modest apparel. And we might ask, well, why does God say that for women? Well, it's simply because an immodestly clothed woman will be a temptation to men. That's the way God has made man and woman. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so there is this connection with men and their eyes and looking upon a woman. As I said, that's the way God has created men. That's why men often struggle with viewing pornography. Women can, but it's far more prevalent among men. And uh, that's why Job said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? He knew that uh, he just couldn't go around looking at women and, and expect to have pure thoughts all the time. So he made a decision of how he was to conduct himself. In the book of Proverbs, to the son regarding the strange woman, Proverbs 6.25 says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. And of course, lust is a heart issue, but it is beginning through the eye, through the eye gate. And uh, James 1.15 tells us, When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We know that from the example of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2, when it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And we know the story that David sent for her. She was another man's wife. He committed immorality uh, and uh, that caused the death of his uh, newborn son. It caused the death of the woman's husband. It caused the death of some of David's other children. It was a terrible price to pay. But it began with the looking. And so uh, this is why the Bible uh, has instruction for a woman to clothe herself in, an, in a modest way. In a modest way. Um, Ezekiel 16.36, for example, makes an a uh, also makes an association of nakedness with idolatry. But the fact is that all of us are created in the image and likeness of God, not of some uh, idol or some false god. So I hope that uh, you can see what the Bible's talking about here, that there is a, a, a standard, I guess you could say, that God has set as to what constitutes nakedness uh, in most cases in the Bible. So the last thing I want us to think about is how does this Bible principle relate to you and me living here in the 21st century? Well, there's a couple of things I want to say about that. First of all, that nakedness has a God-given place within the pure intimacy of marriage. And the reason I say that is because the Bible says that God has sanctioned and hallowed marriage. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible says marriage is honourable. Well, honour is the opposite to shame, right? So there is no shame in the marriage relationship. Marriage is honourable in all and the bed undefiled. Now, anything outside of marriage really is sin because the Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 13, 4, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. But marriage is honourable and, and yet even under the law of Moses, God strictly regulated marriage. It's that important. If you look over in Leviticus chapter 18, and we're certainly not going to read a whole lot of this, but uh, I want you to see how God uh, really does regulate uh, who can get married and to whom. 
In verse number one of Leviticus 18, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Notice this, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. (laughs) All right, we would translate that into the Christian experience as the things that you did before you were saved that were wrong, you don't do those anymore. You're a new creature in Christ and he has changed you and Christ dwells within you, gives you the power over sin. But it also says, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, ye shall not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Which means that now that you're saved, you're still living in the world, and the world has its standards. And as I said at the beginning, on a hot summer's day, particularly in other climates, other places uh, in the world, uh, the way people dress is a real problem. But the Bible says you shall not do those. That's in the Christian experience. We, we don't live like we once were and we don't live like the world lives now. God said in verse 4 here, ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances and walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. And then it goes on to give a whole bunch of prohibitions Uh, in verse 6 none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness I am the Lord and you can read on there but basically the Bible is is saying you cannot marry your parent you cannot marry a sibling you cannot marry an uncle or an aunt or a cousin or an in-law and uh, you know that's even recognized today the state of Washington for example prohibits two people getting married above the first cousin level. (laughs) So you cannot marry your first cousin. I guess that means you can marry a second cousin, I'm not sure, but there are prohibitions on who you can marry, and the Bible sets that forth. And uh, so uh, there is uh, a place here, as we see, concerning marriage that God speaks about. The second thing that we should recognize is that pure nakedness is usual and necessary with infants and small children. Uh, Those of you who, uh, you remember when you bring home a a little baby, uh, there there aren't any uh, prohibitions there as you take care of that child. And uh, I know, and and how you operate in your own family is really between you and God, But uh, sometimes parents will allow their small children to have a bath together. They throw all the kids in the bath. And, uh, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39 does speak of little ones which have no knowledge between good and evil. And uh, all I would say about that as advice is you you need to be very cautious. And if that's what you do, uh, that you take note of an age when children begin to start noticing one another. Uh, yes, they're innocent, uh, and really it doesn't mean a thing to them when they're young, but there is an age, and uh, that's really for parents to determine. Um, and in fact, when it comes to bringing children up in, 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 uh, in your home, uh, it is very important that you are careful in this area, in training and teaching your children. And then the third thing is that Christians need to understand and follow God's standards. And by the way, God does not prohibit nice-looking dresses and nice-looking appearance. Uh, When the Bible says modest apparel, it doesn't mean that a woman must dress as drab as possible and as, uh, I mean, she she needs to dress as she feels uh, she wants to, but certainly God is not uh, forbidding uh, that kind of of attire. Uh, But I think we can apply the biblical standard that a dress should at least go to the knee to cover the thighs and uh, obviously to cover uh, any of the sensual anatomy, uh, whether it's a man or a woman for that matter. You know, the real question is this, uh, particularly for ladies, to what does my appearance draw or attract others? What is it about me that attracts others? Am I attracting them to me so that they'll look at me 
or am I attracting them to my deportment as a believer and a follower of Christ? And 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, talks about that, that a woman's deportment, her conversation, the way she conducts herself, that's her inner beauty that really needs to be seen more than just the outward appearance, which of course can be very attractive but in the wrong way. I did mention at the beginning uh, one of the issues, and I'll just bring this up just so you'll be in the know, but what about uh, swimming? Uh, well, how you do it your, in your home, if you have a backyard swimming pool or whatever, that's, uh, that's between you and God. But I will tell you that in our church activities, whether it's a, a youth camp or uh, a missions trip, uh, that we will always uh, practice what we would call separate bathing for, uh, for men and for women. Uh, or boys and girls, I guess you would say. And that's just uh, a precaution. Uh, I think it's in keeping with these biblical standards. I won't go into that anymore, but um, uh, just to mention that, uh, throw it in for, for what it's worth. Now, I understand that in today's world that this kind of teaching might be a, a little hard to hear, to, difficult to accept. Uh, there are a lot of people who would uh, and maybe you're one of them, I don't know, but you, you would listen to something like this and say, well, that is so old-fashioned and so, so out of step with everybody today. And yes, that's true that some people really struggle with teaching on standards of dress and, and morality. Even sincere Christians can struggle in this area. And of course, one of the things that's thrown out is, well... Uh, and it's been said many times about this church that you're just a legalistic church. Uh, legalism, uh, you may have heard that. That's a smokescreen, by the way. Uh, legalism in the Bible is saying that you have to keep laws in order to be saved. And I'll tell you, we believe, and the Bible teaches, that uh, it's by the grace of God that we are saved, not of our works keeping any laws or commandments or rules or regulations that may be set out because we're incapable of, of, of satisfying the law of God. Every one of us has come short of the glory of God. Uh, we can't do that and the Bible says it's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, God's gift that we are saved. So legalism is just a, a reason to disagree. Let's put it that way. And we need to remember also that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And the way that we all dress, men and women, should be a reflection of the heart. It should be a heart that, that wants to please God. And I'm glad that there is variety and, and there's not, we don't have a Baptist uniform, you know, with a little bonnet or something like that, and we all have to dress the same. There is liberty there, but if your heart is right with God, that would be the concern, I should think, that I want to please God. We have to be careful about making the way people dress as a mark of their spirituality. Uh, and uh, don't go around judging other people and looking them up and down and saying, well, they're not very spiritual. They may be just a, a, a immature Christian. But the thing is, we, we can only look on the outward appearance, not the heart. God looks on the heart. And uh, so... Why have I given this lesson? Well, I've preached something like this before, and it's usually in hot climates. We had a few hot days, so I kind of just brought it to mind. But it is a lesson that I want to, wanted to bring to promote biblical discernment, understanding how God sees things, and translating those into our everyday life. And by the way, it's not American standards that we're looking at. Uh, it's biblical standards and that should have biblical standards would apply in any place and any culture um, I know that sometimes there's been American missionaries who have tried to make uh, people in different countries dress like Americans uh, they're promoting American dress standards and American culture but you know there is the Bible doesn't change it doesn't matter uh, where you are whether you're in Fiji or in Alaska in the winter. God has a plan. And I hope that you'll take it in that spirit tonight and understand that uh, God does say something about the way that we dress. And you can enjoy swimming. You can enjoy 
the hot days, you can enjoy pleasing God and uh, praise the Lord. But unfortunately, in some places in the world, you might enjoy swimming, but you, <laughs> you may not be able to find a place that's uh, safe to bring the family and yourself. Uh, that's just the way the world is. Okay? Well, God bless the teaching of his word.